And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. It's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Merriman to the show. Paul, welcome. Thank, thank you, Rob. Great to be here. This is this is going to be fun. Yes, and we've, we've been na navigating some technical issues, but hopefully we've got them all solved. <laughs> um, it's tough being 78, I got to tell you. Well, it's the blind leading the blind here, Paul. So, uh, <laughs> but you know, whatever, we'll do the best we can. I, uh, how, how are you? You know, I am, I really, I'm fine. I'm in a good place in my life. I can get up at two and three in the morning and uh, my wife understands that I'm just going to work and she still can understand why I do it for nothing, but that's, that's what I like doing. So, so I get up at two and three in the morning too, but, but not on purpose. <laughs> I don't know about you, <laughs> but that's, that's a whole, good. that's a whole nother topic, Paul. Um, <laughs> okay. So I want to I want to just dive right in. I'm going to show a chart that you sent me in just a second, but I want to ask you a conceptual sort of question before we dive into the weeds. So you're very well known for I'll call it variations maybe of your buy and hold, ultimate buy and hold strategy. You've got sort of a a 10 asset class strategy all the way down I think to a 2, two you know with a two asset class or or, or two fund portfolio. All of them, at least all the ones that I've ever seen, uh, favor value, right? Um, and in particularly small cap value. Now, of course, they have other they have other things, but small cap value is a big part of your strategy. And by the way, it's been a part of my own strategy uh, too. But it raises the question. Certainly, if we go back and look at say the last fifty years. And we look at asset classes, boy, small cap value has just crushed everything. And it's not even close, right? My question to you is, why do you think that is? Why out of all the asset classes, small cap value has done the best? Well, the academics would tell us that that is simply a, a combination of two premiums. One is the premium for small, that, that there is historically, has been. And the second is the premium for value. Uh, those are two separate premiums. And as I'm sure we'll talk today, I hope, there may also be a premium for profitability that uh, more folks ag agree with today, which would even look that small at that small cap value historical return as much higher than what we've been looking at all of these years. So, uh, and, and and Rob, if I could correct a, a, a comment, you, you say that I that I lean to value, like I'm I'm favored putting the more weight on value. I'm not really. All I'm doing is giving it equal weight, and uh, or maybe a little more than equal to be fair, because. Uh, the S&P 500 is a blend uh, of value and, and growth. But, but what I'm really doing is on a capitalization weighted basis, there's more value in the portfolio. But basically I'm saying, hey, let these people be equal partners, large and small and value and growth and US and international and all of those things. Yeah. And so it isn't really me leaning on value. It's just not basing the, the portfolio on capitalization weighted. Okay, that's fair. Um, but I want to sort of try to dive down into the details, though, because, you know, you talk about the value premium and the small cap premium. But one, I mean, we could just keep going down the rabbit hole, right? We could say, well, why do they have premiums? You know, you say, well, they're, they're more volatile. Well, why are they more volatile? Well, not maybe not value, small cap, maybe. You know, if we just think about business generally, what is so special about small cap value? And, and by the way, the reason this isn't in my mind, not just an academic exercise. The question in my mind really is, can we expect history to repeat itself? Right. I mean, I, and I know there's no guarantee, but, it, you know, uh, because normally when an asset class outperforms, what happens? Investors flock to it. We see it over and over and over again. And when they flock to it, it affects future expected returns. And so that's kind of the reason for sort of this line of questioning. Well, uh, it, it, it certainly makes sense 
that there's higher risk in a small company than a large. And it makes sense that there's less risk in a, in a, in a company that's in a particular area of high growth and, and, and uh, uh, companies that have big fan bases that, that uh, push those to higher price earnings ratios than would be likely with a small out of favor company. So th that, that it, there isn't a surprise that there should be a, a, a premium. Some people would say, well, small companies have, have further to grow. It's easier for them uh, to, to grow and, and, and get big. Uh, and, and so I, I don't think there's so much a problem uh, with identifying what that risk is. You also, by the way, have risk of liquidity. And if you look at what happened to small cap value and large cap value during the depression, they just got crushed. I mean, you could be down 90 some percent uh, in, in, in that in, during the depression in small cap value. By the way, you were down over 80 percent with the S&P 500 at one point. But right. if you say that about small cap value, that is as soon as everybody knows about it, then I have the premium. Well, my take would be the premium will probably be smaller. Hmm. But the academics will say that there should still be some premium. They will make no attempt to guess how much uh, it should be. And to make the story even in some ways more interesting, in 1924, investors believed that bonds were a good long-term investment and stocks were not. And, and Edgar Lawrence Smith wrote a book about the long-term returns of stocks versus bonds. And that was kind of the first case that was made to the public for stocks over bonds. So if we're gonna question the premium for small cap value versus large growth, why not question the premium of the S&P 500, the stock market versus bonds? And by the way, from 75 to 99, the stock market compounds at over 17%. And then from 2000 to today, it's more like 7%. Mm -hmm. Maybe we are seeing a change in the returns of equities, and we just don't know it yet. So time will right. tell. I do think there's a difference, though, at least, and again, this isn't sort of a data-driven observation, <laughs> unburdened by any research on the subject, Paul. Um, but, you know, one could certainly look at stocks versus bonds and say it makes sense that investors will um, demand more uh, expected return for stocks because you're taking more risk, right? And I suppose one could say the same thing about small cap. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, as you right. pointed out, they're not, their companies aren't as well known. They don't have as much history, um, whatever. Yep. Uh, value versus growth is interesting to me because, you know, I think one can make the argument that value should be less risky <laughs> uh, than growth. Well, um, it, it is. It is in a way. I mean, this is the interesting thing, Ron, yeah. is that when we look at a combination of small cap value and the S&P 500. And we look at the last 52 years and we look at the accumulation of all of the losses that were experienced in those years that performed at a loss. There were greater total losses with the S&P 500 than a combination of the S&P 500 and the small cap value. Yeah. So there, there is in, in essence, uh, some degree of additional safety with, particularly as we start to mix and match these things to build a portfolio. So there right. is some hope there, but I look at it like this, and I may be, this may not be academically sound, but as I look at value companies, they typically have already been through a bear market. They've had a decline. They're out of favor. People don't want them for some reason as much as they want other things. So when a typical bear market comes along, it's not unusual for value to actually hold up fairly well because they've already been there. That certainly happened in the 2000 through 2002 period 
they had been lagging by a, by by a large amount behind growth and so when 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 growth got its punishment value held up better another reason why it's nice to put these things together uh in terms of unit of return per unit of risk yeah yeah so well, let me ask you this then um i was just looking at some data here as we were talking uh, if you look at, say, the last 12 years, I just said it at 2010, the U.S. stock market as a whole has actually outperformed small cap value. Yeah. Um, now, a lot of that outperformance has been in the last couple of years, right? Before that, they were kind of neck and neck. We, we could go back further. Uh, if we go all the, all the way back to 2000, small cap value has outperformed the market as a whole. So I don't know how far back we could go where the, the performance would still favor total U.S. market, yeah. maybe a couple of more years. I guess my question, though, is, uh, is that the worst period of relative performance for small cap value? Call no. it, yeah, right. No. Okay, so is there a worse period further oh, back? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, as a matter of fact, if you looked at the last 94 years, uh, you would see that it, it is not unusual for the small cap value on a relative basis to underperform the S&P 500 for 15 to almost 20 years. So, so this is one of the reasons I think that, that value is such a difficult thing for people to hold because they're going to become attracted when it's been doing well. That's what happens in this business. And they're going to get in after it's had a favorable run. And then they're going to face a potentially a long period of time. They would have been better off staying where they were before. How new is that story? And 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 so that I think is the real hurdle for small cap value is you've got to be prepared to wait a long time, sometimes historically, uh, to to get that premium. And the and the first example of that was what happened in the depression. Because the last place you wanted to be in a depression is in, in, in value companies that are not as strong as the growth companies. So again, as I mentioned earlier, they got hit really hard. But then when things straightened themselves out, and this is very typical, and you've had a big market correction, the value stocks and small cap value tend to take off historically like a rocket and and but you got to be there and the problem is if you chase returns you're going to be on the wrong side of that mountain too much of the time and you're probably better off st staying in the total market index for life than you are chasing recent returns of any asset class okay well let me show you i'm going to put up on the screen so others can see it a chart i don't know if it'll show up on your computer that's a this is a this will be an experiment but i can tell you what it is you sent it to me it's the sound investing u.s equity portfolio ordinal rank summary oh yes okay so yes. um because I, what i want what i'm hoping you can do is sort of walk us through what this means um let me uh put it up on the screen again i don't know if you'll see it on you see that on your computer i do Oh, great. I, do. I love this. Uh, Daryl Balls, who's our director of analytics, uh, I asked him if he could produce a quilt chart of the year-by-year -year results from 1928 to 2021, uh, showing the return of U.S. value at the S&P 500 and all value U.S. A two fund portfolio that was 50% small cap value and 50% S&P 500 and a portfolio that's simply 25% each of U.S. large value, U.S. small value, large blend and small blend. So just four major asset classes. How did they, how did they do? How often were they at the top? How often were they at the bottom? And I just, I love that quilt chart. But here is the, here shows the final ranking of these different asset classes and combinations. In the top, and over that period of time, it's broken down into 20% uh, uh, increments. So 45 years, or 48% of the years, small cap value was the number one performer. It was the number two, three, or four performer, seldom, but it was often the worst. 31 
years, uh, it was the worst performer. Right. And then when you look at the bottom of the page where you have just the S&P 500, you'll notice the S&P 500 is either at the top, 36%, 80, 36 years, or at the bottom, 48 years. Now, by the way, we expect the S&P 500 should be at the bottom most of the time because it's the highest quality asset class. And we expect that small cap value should be at the top most of the time because it has had the best long-term return. But notice what happens when you, and, and, and by the way, it has to happen this way. When you have a portfolio that's half U.S. small cap value and half S&P 500, they're never first. They're never last. They have to be in between. And what you see there, the CAGR, the, the uh, compound annualized growth rate for the two fund strategy, half U.S. large and half U.S. small value, 12.2% versus the, 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 the return for the uh, S&P 500 of 10.2%. Uh, 2% more, 2% more, and in a way, at no more risk over time. One year at a time, there's no question, but over 10 years or 20 years, in fact, there's never been a 21, a 20 year period that small cap value hasn't done better than, uh, the, than the S&P 500. Right. So, um where do you get your data to go all the way back to 1928 for some of these asset classes? Well, we get it from dimensional funds database. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's all index driven. Now I want to be, this is, this is an interesting problem we have because when you talk about the underperformance of a particular asset class, like small cap value, it wouldn't be surprising to find out you're talking about the Russell 2000 small cap, value index and and what you need that people need to understand and i've just gotten the education myself in the in, in the last years about this is how very very different one index of small cap value could be from another because it turns out that when you take apart the the uh small cap value index from russell it's got a whole bunch of growth in it. <laughs> it's no. got a whole bunch of unprofitable, uh, likely to be unproductive small cap value. And this is what our friends at, at Advantis uh, have taught us as well as DFA. There's a, there's a part of small cap value that not surprisingly does a whole bunch better historically than another part of small cap value. But if you include all of them in the portfolio, you're going to get a much different return. And you can even look at last year, a lot of the kind of Russell 2000 small cap value performance uh, was around 28% up for the year. You go out you go out into the more profitable small cap value part of the uh, of the table, and they were up thirty nine to forty two. Well, that that's a that's a really important point, Paul. Um, and so it raises, I think, a question: What funds do you like uh, for small cap value that are consistent with the charts that you put together for your small cap small cap value asset classes? Well, considering that that that. Th those tables that go back to 1928 are being driven by the beliefs of the folks like Dr. Fama and Dr. French and, and the folks at DFA and all the people at Avantis, almost all of them came from DFA. So they're, they're really in many, they have a lot of things in common. And, and so I have myself since the mid nineties been using the work of, of DFA. And when I was an advisor up through 2012, that's what that's what we did. We built these very complex portfolios of DFA funds in order to try to squeeze out the best unit of return per unit of risk using all that academic work that Obama and French and others ha had applied. Now, 
since then, we've had new competition. Not we have, DFA has. And it's tough competition because they learned at the foot of the master and, and, and they're starting fresh. And there are sometimes in this business some advantages to start fresh because you don't have to you don't have to make some large uh, radical move in how you do things in order to change to what you want to be so does all of that to say you you like the dfa small cap value you like avanta's small cap value i do are there uh just, just so folks can have like maybe a complete listing are there other fund families that, that have small cap value that in your mind are, are sort of consistent with the methodology that DFA, and I can put, I can put well, the well, DFA. There are, and and uh, Chris Pedersen, who is the brains of uh, the best in class uh, ETFs, uh, he, he does have to pick one as the best. Uh, and we're not trying to pick it for the next year. We're trying to pick it for as long as, as whatever makes it the best stays the best. Uh, but he also includes uh, some others because there are people who may have access to all ETFs and some may have only the access they may get through maybe a, the back office of a 401k plan where they can sell right. direct. Right. Uh, so he's got a list of uh, ones that were, are okay. I mean, you look, for example, at Vanguard. Vanguard has uh, uh, the uh, VBR and it has VIOV. A VIOV is more like what they're doing at Avantis and DFA than a VBR is. Yeah. And, and so if, if, if you had to choose between those two, uh, VIOV would be uh, probably a more profitable. Also, it's not just, as you know, Rob, it isn't just about the profitability of a company. It's not just about the, the book versus market price. It's, it's also about things like the size of the company and, and, the, and the amount of turnover uh, in, in a particular uh, a fund. Uh, but VBR, I think the average size company is four and a half billion dollars. Yeah. And, it's really and a small mid cap. It's really a small mid cap right. fund. Pardon? Right. It's really it's, it's really a blend of small and mid cap. Yeah. Yep. That's what it's starting yeah. to look like. And and yet it yeah. will probably produce uh, a, a decent premium. You will have just taken less risk to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me. So let's. So one one viewer mentioned that I I actually had forgotten about this, but you have a list of sort of your top funds on your website, right? The ones that you like we do they are the best in class yeah. in each asset class that we believe is le could legitimately be in your portfolio yeah. in building uh, a, a proper balance of asset classes i i will add a link to that below the video when we're done okay great um so kind of want to step back a bit we were looking and i'll put it back up on the screen we were looking um give me just a second here we were looking at this chart, which has got, as, as you can see, the two fund and the four fund, right? And then you've yep. got uh, this one. This is a one version of it, but this is, I guess you could call it a, is that 10 funds? I guess it's a 10 fund. Yeah, version. and that was the way this whole thing started in 1994, I think it was, Rob, with the 10 funds. Okay. And by right. the way, it doesn't look like there are 10, but... Uh, the column that is headed international uh, is a combination of large, small, blend, and value international. And the purpose, and this is a powerful, powerful table here. All I wanted to show was with this was what if we started with all of our money in the S&P 500 and had invested $100,000? And I started doing this back in the 1990s. And we, bring, and we update it every year. Well, you can see there that a $100,000 investment grew to over $23 million if you just invested in the S&P 500. But what if? What if we just took a baby step and added large cap value 10%? So you got 90% S&P 500, 10% large cap value 
it increased the return by two tenths of one percent. Well, that is not a minor increase, particularly if you're not taking a lot of extra risk to get it. And it's only 10 percent. And so uh, and the standard deviation is, is actually a little bit lower because they, they don't they don't correlate all the time. But the bottom line is every time we move to another column, we're we're taking a little bit of small cap blend in the portfolio, a little bit of small cap value, a little bit of REITs, and then those four international asset classes, and finally, a little slice of emerging markets. And the reason I called it way back in the 90s, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio was I was simply making the point, I don't know how to do it any better. That's what I said then, because I wasn't making a claim to any fame. The idea was to take fame away from anybody and divide it evenly amongst these major equity asset classes. And so you go from 23 million to over 47 million by making these small changes. And then, I think this is important too. In the table right below it, the only difference is we rebalance monthly instead of annually. And look what happens to the return. The return goes down. Look what happens yeah. to the risk. The risk goes down. And there are a lot of people who believe that the good thing to do is to is to to rebalance on a regular basis, and it's probably just the opposite. Probably the best thing to do is to rebalance on a regular, an irregular basis yeah. because you're going to make more money if you don't rebalance too often. Yeah. So how would you how would you help people figure out what's best for them? Two fund, four fund, 10 fund? How do you decide? Well, it may be what they have available to them. Yeah. Uh, it may be because it's something they look at it and they say, I can believe in that because we all know that the emotional hurdles in this industry are the are the biggest of all hurdles, that and talking to a commission salesperson. And so <laughs> what we want to do is to see if we can match a person up to a particular combination. Now, for example, there are people who love J.L. Collins' recommendation putting everything into a total market index. That's great. But what would happen if you just put 10% in small cap value? And we have a table like that. It compares just in 10% increments. So it's not even just putting the S&P and small cap value together, but how much of each of those. And what we've done as best we can, Rob, is present information just as if I was your investment advisor and I'm sitting with you at my desk and I lay these tables out there for you to look at and we say, hey, look how much you lose if you do this. Look how different you are from the S&P 500 if you do this. And then after having a conversation, we decide, okay, let's go with this strategy. Man, that's what advisors do. They try to find a, a fit for an investor. My wow. challenge is, I know I'm, I'm no longer an investment advisor. I am but a teacher and I love it. But what we do with these tables that we have is show people that combination. What is the risk exposure? How much more risk if you put together a portfolio that is 50-50 S&P 500 small cap value versus the S&P 500? We have a table that shows that so that you can sift through these tables to find some combination that feels good. Now, a lot of people like the four fund strategy. A lot of people like the all, all US four fund strategy. Why? Because there's more diversification. There's large blend, which means you got some growth. There's large value. There's small blend. There's small value. It feels better to have all that diversification. What is so marvelous, Rob, is that whether it's the four fund US or a worldwide four fund, so you've got some value and some growth and some and, and, and small and large, both US and international, the four fund strategy, all US, the four fund worldwide, and the 10 fund strategy all have virtually the same return at almost the same risk. 
Mm. So it's your choice. And unfortunately, I can't be there to charge you a whole bunch of money to make it. I make that information free in the hopes that you'll save that money and compound it for your family and not for mine. Yeah, that's great. Let me um, let me show the quilt the quilt chart that you talked about. Oh, great! Uh, and by the way, um, if these are available online, I'll link to them as well below the video. I don't know if they are. They are. They're um, all there, Rob. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I'll send you the links. Um, this is the one. I think you sent me two of them. This is actually the second one because it's um it's easier to. It's still probably tough for people to read, but I guess you can just look at the colors. Here's your your guide down here, right? Blue is small cap value and so on. Yeah, green is green is the S&P 500. And what I love people to see is those early years, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. I mentioned that earlier. Boy, you want to be in high quality. If you're going to be a market timer, you want to be in high quality during a catastrophic event. The same thing is true with government bonds. They're going to do better more than likely in a catastrophic event than, than corporates are. But we also are going to see periods where, and if you look down in the, the third groupings there, you'll see the S&P 500 along the bottom most of the time. So yeah. it never means it's the end of anything. When you have people saying it's the end of small cap value, it's the end of small cap, it's the, it's the end of whatever, the end of stocks. No, that's not the way it works, at least not from the past. And so what I really love about this table is the one that is right there in the middle, that purple one, that is the four fund strategy. It is almost always in the middle. And for my money, for what I believe, if I can get something to give a decent return and always kind of be in the middle, never be at the top, never be at the bottom, if I could do that and get a good return or, or the return I need or want, Boy, that is less risk in my mind than having something that jumps up and down and the best and then it's the worst and all of those things that that, that test our commitment to staying the course. Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing that I love about this chart is actually this first box up here because if you look at small cap value for the first five years, it's either last or second to last. Oh, yeah. And and, 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 you know, everything was up in 28, but starting in 29, it lost 37, then it lost 43, it lost 55, and it lost 10. And I suspect the majority of investors would not have survived, would, would not have lived through that without changing their asset allocation. But, but had you stuck it out, you earned 125% <laughs> in 1933. Well, as a matter of fact, Rob, uh, the S&P 500, uh, for what it's worth, uh, its worst 40-year uh, period was a gain, a compound rate of return of 8.9. Its best was a compound rate of return of 12.5. Both of those are pretty good, and when you inflation adjust them, there's not that much difference between the two of them. But what is interesting is the worst period 40 years started in 29 the best 40 year period started in 33. So it is, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to wrap our arms around what the real lifetime investment strategy is going to be like. I've got a new granddaughter coming into my life, our first granddaughter in October. And- Congratulations. And, uh, thank you. And, and, and that little girl's gonna have a, an account set up and and I'm struggling whether that should be all small cap value or a split between the S&P 500 and small cap value. I'm, I'm leaning towards the split only because she's going to have plenty <laughs> if she gets anything close to what the past has been like. But the idea of this particular money is it is never sold. This is, I'll be dead and buried, so I cannot rule from the grave the way I'd like to. It, it will not be sold until she is in retirement and she only sells pieces of it to, uh, to, to, to live on and just let it go. Let it ride. Many of us, many of us have at some time in our life held a company for a lifetime. 
Lots of people start a company in their 20s and they run that 20 for decades and decades and they milk it for, for all they can. And then they even continue to own it, own it in their old age and they continue to be rewarded for having started that company. Yeah. Well, it seems to me, if I could help a little person not buy one company, but buy 600 to 1,000 companies and, 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 and know that all those people theoretically are coming to work in the morning to work for her and that they'll be working for her for the rest of her life. I think that's a, that's a pretty good deal. If I could ever convince her to do that, how do you yeah. do that? What would you say to somebody, Rob, to convince them that investing is about doing something right for a lifetime? Yeah, it's tough. Um, I try to look at history, right? Um, my own experience. And then I, and then if that fails, I just send them to you, Paul. I don't know. What. <laughs> um, well, not a bad something, move. <laughs> something you just said that really struck me that I hope people latched onto. And that was, you said you're struggling to figure out how you're going to invest your money. And um, I think that's important because I think most people struggle at various times. What asset classes should I use? You know, should I do a two fund, a four fund, something different? And, and and I guess the point to make is that's normal. I mean, because this it's it's not as if there's just one solution and everyone should follow it. Um, and I think you know I've struggled at times. You know, do I do I have REITs? Do I have small cap value? How complicated do I make my portfolio? I mean, these are just these are just things that we all try to figure out what's best for us and stick to whatever we decide. Um, so I think that's I, I'm glad you you use that word. I mean, and it definitely I, I've definitely yes. experienced that myself. What kind are you just putting this money for your granddaughter in just a, uh, I guess, just a regular, you know, taxable account? It's going to be uh, what I'm recommending uh, is it's going to be in a in, in a an account that my daughter uh, will hold, uh, not a custodial account. I don't, I really don't want it to be an account that the child has access to okay. at 18. The purpose of the amount of money that I'm making is to fund a Roth IRA. That's what I wanted to fund. Uh, okay. I want her, I would like to be able to put away a substantial amount of money as soon as she starts earning money. So the original investment will be, hopefully be put into, let's say, the combination of the S&P 500 and small cap yeah. value, no fixed income. That's a whole other conversation, Rob, but an important one for people who want to stay the course to have the right amount of fixed income, but no fixed income here. And that as soon as she has any earned income, and as you know, and I'm sure you tell the folks, they can they can be paid to mow the lawn. They can be paid to do stuff. They 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 can right. use that as the basis of a Roth IRA. They just can't be paid a, 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 a allowance and count that. Allowances are not counted for some reason. Uh, and and so as early as she can start earning money that can be put in matched out of the. I don't expect her to put the money in. I. I the, my granddaughter, yeah. if she earns yeah. money, that's great. And then my daughter will figure out how to teach her the right thing to do with what she earns. But this money I'm putting in, it is to fund the Roth IRA for as long as it possibly can. Okay, good. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, fixed income. So how do you think about stock versus bond allocation You know, over time? And I guess we can maybe work into that questions of glide path and how you think about risk and how folks should structure their portfolio. Well, see, if I would, when I would sit down with somebody to try to figure out what the right thing for them to do is, uh, I would want to know how much money they're willing to lose. I used to, when I did my workshops for the public, I used to give them a guarantee, and that is if you'll follow my advice, I promise you'll lose money. I guarantee you will lose money. And I just want to know if I'm able to be of any help, how much you're willing to lose, because that's when we're tested. Yes, we can be tested because our neighbor's making more than we are in a bull market, but typically it is when we've lost more than we're ready to lose that we bail out, or we we imagine the market's going to go down 80%. We can see it, it. we're going to go broke if we just sit here and allow this to happen. So we have tables, we always have tables that show combinations of the S&P 500. In fact, all nine of our portfolios 
Each one of them has a page devoted to combining it in 10% increments with fixed income. So you could see the S&P 500 with 10% bonds, 20% bonds, 30, all the way up to 100% bonds. And in each case at the bottom of the page, it'll say, okay, if you had done this over the last 52 years, you would have had a year that you were down, let's say it's a 50-50 strategy, 50% 50 bonds, 50% stocks. It would show you a loss of 23%. Now, are you ready to lose 23% as a part of the process? And if not, does that mean maybe you need to save more before you retire? You need to plan on living on less? There are all these moving parts, but these tables are built so people can see the, the, the real losses. Now, I don't know that I, that's a different, that's a different one. Well, that does show it. Yes, you're right. That does show it, Rob. That shows you, for example, over the last 94 years, that the best year for the S&P 500 in the left and the large cap blend, LCB, the best year was a gain of 54%. Uh, the worst year was a loss of 43.3. Now, right. I think it's important to note that there were many losses of more than 50% over that 94 year period they just didn't happen that didn't happen during the calendar year so yeah, the, the stock Rob market didn't, didn't cooperate with our calendar system yeah so and and of course the the main story about this uh, i think about this particular series of tables is that the longer you go out the closer the expected returns become because one year at a time the difference between the worst and the and the best is huge by the time you get out to 40 years, the difference between the best and the worst is is uh, is not great. Yeah. Which is what yeah. we want young people to know. By the way, look at that small cap value over there. Best 40-year period, 19% compound rate of return. Worst compound rate of return for 40 years, 106 so what I'd if someone listening to this video said, Paul, I'm a believer. I'm putting 100% in small cap value. How would you react to that? Well, I actually, I, I encourage first time investors, young investors to put all of their money for the first five years into a Roth IRA in small cap value and then stop. If, if small cap value is all that it's made up to be. That five-year commitment for the next 40, 50, 60 years of your life, that in and of itself will like, uh, you will have in, invested in something very, very special. Then you could go ahead and be more traditional from that point on. But would I advocate somebody ever be in small cap value all of their life? Well, I don't find it as difficult as some people might expect. I have friends who are my age who are still sitting basically on a handful of great growth companies that they bought because those companies were in the Pacific Northwest, which means you're probably sitting on some uh, Microsoft and you're sitting on some Costco and sitting on some Starbucks. And, and those people are still sitting on those things because they've treated them well for a very long period of time. So I would say investing all your money in small cap value is no more risky than investing your money in a handful of, 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 of growth companies that you think are going to be successful over the long term. Because as we know, a lot of those companies just don't make it. You have probably a yeah. higher probability of long-term success with small cap value than any 10 high growth companies you might put your money in today. I think most though would say, yeah, that might be true, but they're not really comparing small cap value with a handful of stocks. They're thinking more small cap value versus a more diversified portfolio, not that's, unlike what, you've, you know, that's what true. you've proposed. Yeah, in which case I would not be an advocate. If it is about what people believe, I'm trying to take a lot of people. Uh, I'm not trying to take them 
from J.L. Collins. I think his work is just great. I'm trying to get them to understand that they would take 10% of that portfolio and put it into small cap value that would likely raise the return yeah. by somewhere between three tenths to a to five tenths of a percent. Right, right. So let's and get back you, to stock. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I want no, to get no, back to stock, stock versus bond allocation. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you think through that question? How do people decide? How should well, they decide? I mean, I'm 78 years old. My wife and I are 50% stocks, 50% bonds. Okay. We could afford to be all in equities. We could do that. Uh, and 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 I could have afforded to continue to own my company and just retire. I could have done that. But it's just my belief personally that there's a time you pass the baton of risk to others. And while I'm willing to have a loss of as, as much as 20 to 25% of the value of our holdings, I'm not willing to have a loss of 60, 70, 80% of what we have. And the reality is many people like myself live in the back of our mind. There's, there's this little thing about a catastrophic event and people who don't have this in the back of their mind, Rob, they just don't get it because those of us who are stuck with that worry about the catastrophic, and I've had it all my life. I've had it all my life that everything's going to crash around me just around the corner. And so I've been way more conservative. That, than I needed to be. So that's the hard part about being a good advisor. You have to figure out how do people feel about loss? Now they can claim they are willing to accept a lot of loss in a bull market. And you know this, then they cry their eyes out when a traditional bear market happens. Yeah. How could it possibly be? And, and, and so it is a matter of accepting loss. And so in my buy and hold portfolio, I am totally ex accepting the, the the idea that there's a possibility that I'll lose 25% of what's in that part of the portfolio. And then really, then I, I'll, and this is the whole story, the other half of my portfolio, because half is buy and hold, the other half of my portfolio is managed with market timing. And instead of being 50-50 stocks and bonds, it's 70% equities, 30% fixed income, because market timing, because of the exit strategy, is much less risky. Having said that, that that's what I do. Remember, I've got this catastrophic concern. I do not recommend people use market timing and try to do it on their own. That is the hardest, most difficult strategy that I know of. To be, to be able to wake up every morning and take responsibility for the direction of the market. I don't. I have somebody else do it because I would never be able to wake up every morning and face that knowing that I've got this catastrophic concern in the back of my head. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring that up, Paul. You and I have talked about that in the past. Um, and I had Bill Bengen on the show, the father of the 4% rule, and he, he's a, a market, I wouldn't describe you as a market timer. Part of your portfolio is, I yeah. suppose. But from what I understood from my talk with him, he's basically, he hires a company or uses a, some resource and it's all market timing. And I think um, that surprised me. I think it surprised a lot of viewers, largely because all of his research is based on not timing the market. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, market timing is just something that I've never felt I... I, I never felt I would be good at, and I've never had the confidence in anyone else, honestly, uh, to, to do it. Yeah. And Rob, to be to be fair, the reason I, I can I can really suggest not using market timing for people is that you can get about the same unit of return per unit of risk with buy and hold by having the right amount of fixed income in the portfolio. So there, there, there is no magic to this. This is all about yeah. controlling the exposure to loss. Well, there's something else that I think is really important here. And this is not specific to your situation. Obviously, I don't know your financial situation. Uh, and I don't know Bill Binkins. But you'll often hear about people that take a certain investment strategy. 
Uh, and what, but what you don't hear is they've got so much money that it honestly doesn't matter. So like, I, I always cringe at the celebrity billionaires yeah. Yeah. who pump crypto. Oh, no, you know, I, I mean, enough. Elon Musk could lose, all, and I don't even know if he's still in crypto now. He could lose all of his Bitcoin, all of his Dogecoin, and it wouldn't matter to him. I mean, he, he may not be happy about it. Um, and, and there have been other celebrities that you know talk about this or they talk about options trading and but what you're never really going to know is are they really do they really have skin in the game right right and um so i just caution people at the end of the day you got to figure out what you can live with and what you think is the best strategy um you know it, and it even it even comes up in uh, it's something else i wanted to talk to you about and it kind of is related to stock bond allocation Retirement withdrawal strategies. Mm -hmm. You know, do you follow a constant dollar approach like the four percent rule? Do you use some sort of flexible or dynamic approach? Like, I don't know if you're more familiar with Guyton Klinger is one example of that. There are others, and a lot of the people writing about these things, frankly, it doesn't matter what they do. <laughs> they they could pick whatever they wanted, and they would be fine. Um, you know, it 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 does matter to me, Robin. Just as a as a point, um, while we have more tables on distributions, hundreds of tables, uh, my wife and I use a flexible variable strategy, and I am a great advocate. Uh, this was an interesting conversation I I had when I when I met with John Bogle because he's remember he's the enough guy. People should have enough. I'm the guy that wants people to have more than enough. By the way, not for greed purposes, but because so many things go wrong in the world, I'm the catastrophic guy, that you need to you're, have you're, more than just, enough. You're just a, you're a breath of fresh air, Paul. I mean, the world is coming to an end, but we'll have a good there portfolio. Go. Sorry yeah, about that. that. But, but what my wife and I do, we oversaved. So we take out 5% at the beginning of each year. I don't want to be thinking about taking money out when the market's going up and down. That is supposed to be our budget. It is our budget for giving away. It is our budget uh, for living on. And 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 my hope is, is that, well, for one thing, my IRA ends up going to our foundation uh, for the Financial Education Foundation. So we're we're trying to build it to be worth more than than certainly than we need but i really believe in that variable distribution because when the market goes down it does something magic it makes you live on less and by living on less if you if you haven't seen the tables it's remarkable if you take out five percent and you adjust that for inflation many times you're going to be broke uh, early in your life but if you take out five percent variable and make life work on that, just taking out less when the market's going down has a huge defensive uh, step to it. Okay, but now I have to challenge this a little bit. Um, uh, so you take out 5% every year, so it's variable because your, your portfolio balance is different every yeah. year. Um, you mentioned that that 5% in addition to, you know, buying food and paying the utilities, uh, it, some of that you give away, right, to charity. Well, so to be question, fair, we actually, Rob, we we give our IRA distribution to charity. Okay, but that's part of your 5%. No. Oh, so is your 5% only used for living expense, you know, for, for you know, to live on? So, so then some years you have to cut back significantly. Well, we could. That's well, no, right. I mean, you, you, what do you mean you could? I mean, if you're taking out 5% every year and your portfolio is down 20%, let's say, yeah, one year. It means we're going to get a 20% decrease in our next year's distribution. Right. So how do you how do you deal with that? I mean, does, in those years, is your life a lot different than in the years where it's up 20%? Well, look, I'm like a lot of uh, our our marriage is like a lot of couples there's a spender and a saver the reason i love this careful here now that, paul she, she could be watching so just oh no I no she, to, <laughs> I just, i'm not your well, lawyer knows, but if i were i would suggest that you maybe think about the rest yeah, of your company the reality is i want her to spend 
but not when the market's down. Okay. Because, and I think there are, again, there are a lot of us who don't mind spending when things are going well, but we want to have a defensive agreement when things aren't going so well. But we haven't had to face anything very bad. I mean, we, I, I retired in 2012, and, and we haven't had any you're not, you're real not retired, Paul. You work harder than anyone I know. Well, whatever, whatever it is, I love doing it. It's just that there's no there's no money in it, but that makes it more fun, I think. So l let's talk about Glide Path. Yeah. So, how do you think stocks and stock and bond allocation should change as we say as we get close to retirement and then into retirement? Well, um, we have. I just yesterday I was looking at this. The, hi the history of the glide path based on your age. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, the original one I started in the business in the 60s was 100 minus your age. Then it became 110. Uh, and then I think it's 130 minus your age is probably a legitimate glide path if you're going to use that kind of a formula. It, it, cha it changed as bond yields went down. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it also changed because I think people don't, they're going to live a long time, yeah. young people That's today. True. And uh, and and they need to probably uh, try to be exposed to stocks longer than their grandparents uh, might have been. I, my glide path is I'm 50% for the rest of my life. Okay. Get into retirement, 50%. That's it. If my money was at, at Vanguard, they'd have me 70% in fixed income, 30% oh. in equity at my age. Yeah, like with a target date fund or something. Yeah. 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 All and the target date funds are like that. They're all like that. Well, or, they got to be conservative. They got to build yeah. it for the slowest hiker. <laughs> okay. Well, what was your what was your stock bond allocation in your working years? Let's say you, you said you retired in 2012. What, what, what was your stock bond allocation in 2005? Well, it was uh, it was mostly timing. Mm. And it was all equity. Wow, 100%. Yeah. With and timing. this from a guy who thinks the world's going to end. That's no, pretty good, timing, Paul. Remember, timing is, is, is a defensive. It has a trigger. Mm. Yeah, but it's and, still uh, all equity, you said. So, I mean, I don't know if you go I know, but I but, but I could or... live with it because I I felt here's that here's this emotional decision making process that doesn't make sense to the outsider, but having been an uh, an investment advisor for 30 years, it was hard to find a conversation that did make sense if you dig deep enough. Yeah. Because the emotional yeah. aspects of investing are so deep for people. Well, let's let's talk about market timing for a minute. And those watching know, you know, I'm not a market timer, but um, I like to learn and hear how other people do it. I'd be curious your thoughts if, if uh, of how a market timer would approach the current environment, specifically given our inflation right now. Well, it depends on what the market timer strategy is. Uh, if if they're using a trend following strategy, then they're supposed to do exactly what the trend following strategy says. I have some money in a hedge fund that I helped start in 1995, and it combines market timing uh, uh, with leverage, but only when you're totally in the market, uh, and you can go down to being almost all out of the market. Well. Every one of those, and there can be up to a hundred different funds that are being market timed. Each one of those is being individually timed. And when it says sell, you don't second guess. So there's no change in the system because of where the market is. Other people who might have a market timing system based on uh, some sort of economic model, they have to now read the tea leaves in their economic model and do what they think it says. And, and if it sounds like I think it's more art than science, I do think it is basically an art. Whereas 
trend following market timing systems are just dumb mechanical systems. There's nothing, no attempt to predict wh where the market might go. I, I ended up on Wall Street week with Louis Rukeyser way back in the um, 1990. And the reason I got there was because uh, I had all of our clients' money out of the market uh, in 1987, about a month before the market crashed. And as hard as I told people that I didn't call the crash, people still wanted to believe I called the crash. No, I had a system that was out when the market crashed. There is a terrible big difference between the two because the minute you think somebody can call a crash, you, uh, you are in trouble because no. Did you get them back into the market as, uh, right after the crash? Because it went right no. back up. You know something? If I wanted to be a hero and look like a, a genius and having gotten them out at, at, at a much higher price, I could have taken that risk, but I would not have been following the systems. Yeah, yeah. Let me, uh, if you've got just a few more minutes, uh, sure. I'm just going to look through the chat because people have asked some questions. Um, and I want to mention the first one from Quincy. I'll put it up on the screen. I think we've addressed this, but um, his question is, I think you've sort of hit this. Why do you favor, for example, Avantis's AVUV small cap value over Vanguard? I know we talked about how VBR is really sort of a small mid cap, but, but I think you also mentioned profitability, right? Right. I mean, they are, um, the, the people at Avantis, whether it's a small cap fund or their a uh, large cap blend us they apply these kinds of of uh of discipline uh one is uh, they're going to have a, a small size which is what you want for small cap value but they are going to focus on those companies that have profits and that are undervalued and they have a mechanical way to determine uh, per their formula uh, what that undervalued, how they become undervalued so that they are sitting for, for example, uh, I, I just, I, I grabbed this cause I thought this might come up. If you looked at their, um, their, even their large cap fund, the blend, uh, you would see that they have 54% of that fund in the very upper right hand corner of low book the high book to value price and profitability they're they're heavily focused on profitability by the way does this start to sound at all like warren buffett good profitability and a low price uh, as opposed to if it, with the russell 3000 you have 39 percent that is in that upper right-hand corner. And, yeah. and, and that would be true of all of uh, Avantis large cap value is 96% of what they have is in that upper right corner. Are you getting that data from Morningstar or where are you getting that data? Morningstar. Oh, from their okay. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Uh, not the, no, not the percentage in those. No, that is actually out of Avantis themselves. Okay. Do you know if that's publicly available? That's a good question. That's a good question. Some of their, uh, I, I would recommend if you just go to the Avantis website and go through what they re, re, the, what they give to the public to, to read, that's all that they can disclose. But it will, it may not give you all of the little numbers, but you will certainly get a sense of what it is that they are doing. Okay. And it's interesting so because... Last year, both DFA small cap value and Avantis were were much much higher than most of the small cap value funds, and for the and basically, I think for the same reasons. Yeah, and they're accused of being actively managed. Well, they are in a sense actively managed, in that once somebody is is down into that into into an area where they don't have the profitability that they need or the price is out of line for whatever, however they get there, they do in fact get out, but their tax, their turnover is still actually lower than 
than the uh, Vanguard VIOV. Yeah. They've got about 20% um, turnover versus 30 at Vanguard. Well, you'd have to, it'd be interesting to look at the tax issues because, you know, the turnover kind of is, is, is to some extent a guide, but of course, it, it doesn't necessarily follow that the, the not, higher turnover. Not, certainly is not in the ETF. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you, my, I don't have, I've considered AVUV. I've not invested in it. I might, but um, my concern is just that it doesn't have any track record yet. It's only been around a couple of years. You know um, something, though, I, just for what it's worth, the things you need to look at at Morningstar, the size of company, how many companies, they have over 600 companies. You can look, and this you can look at, and you can compare the price to cash flow. Mm -hmm. You can compare uh, the, uh, what is it, the, the, certainly the, the book, book to price. Yeah. You, you can compare things that, that, that indicate uh, well, their PE ratio, they have a very low PE ratio, much lower than, than, uh, these other, like the Russell 2000 value, uh, the P the PE ratio is about three times higher. You'll also note, you would also note if you looked, uh, at, at the, at the qualif the, the, there is on, on, uh, as you got it there, the quality indicator will be higher there than at VBR, for example, or or at um, at uh, VIOV. Yeah. So you can look at all of those things uh, and and get an idea of of uh, uh, what is their their orientation in terms of where they're looking at profitability, and that price per cash flow under measures. That price per cash flow, you want to be low. The price to sales, you want to be low. Do you, uh, um, first of all, I think we make a good team. You can just share your wisdom nonstop, and I'll try to find the most relevant website to pull up on the screen. I think that's great. Um, well, I'm curious, and this this is a question I'll just throw up here real quick. Um, is that the right question? No, that's not the one I wanted to show. Uh, well, I, I can't find it now, but the one I wanted to I show was... one more comment to, to yeah. answer that last question. They are not making changes because they think a company has a great future or they like the management. It has nothing to do with stock picking. Yeah, no, no. It has I, I, right. to do with the ratios that they well, this... that indicate whether there is a higher probability of gain than not and 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 if you just if you only looked at this relationship between those things that are expected to have low earnings and and returns versus those things that are expected to have higher earnings and return right. why wouldn't that make sense no it it, it makes sense I, I can't yeah I, well and it gets to this question from daniel do you have any particular measure of value that you prefer over others or do you just look at them all well, what I was what I was told when I went to school at, in the in the DFA courses that I took in the 1990s uh, is that while PE ratio can be used and and uh, other ratios can be used, that the most tax efficient way uh, is the a book to market. Uh, as the number one uh, uh, way to 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 identify those companies that are likely not only to to have better future returns uh, at a risk, by the way, and 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 the academics were quick to point out back in the 1990s that if you don't, they say don't buy these one at a time, these stocks, because if you look at a group of them. Five years from now, half of them will still be out of favor. And it's the other half that are going to make the day for that asset class. And they'll admit nobody, they can't find anybody that knows how to how to tell which are going to be the good half to be in. And and uh, and and so uh, they said book to market was the best. Yeah. Yeah. After taxes. Right. And after the and after the cost. 
there's also a cost to getting in and out of these things. Yeah. Um, VJ had a question. I think we've covered it. And I'll just say to VJ, um, I'm going to link to that site, Paul, on your on your website that lists your, you know, the, the funds that you guys like. Um, so I will do that. Thank you. Um, yes. And and it is not a blurry line, the difference between a small and 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 mid. It may look like a blurry line because you may see a mid is around a, a 10 billion uh, and the small is down around uh, at a much a much lower number uh, down as a matter of fact under 2 billion in some cases uh, and so the uh, uh, there is there is a major difference in the returns over time yeah. by the way there's a difference between mid and large too there's nothing wrong with mid uh, there is some rebalancing advantages theoretically being out at the edges rather than being in the middle. Yeah, yeah. What does um, what does your bond portfolio look like? Your fixed income? What's it in? Well, we and this goes back to my days of being an investment advisor. We we only had the bonds in the portfolio to stabilize against the volatility that people were willing to accept in the equity part of their portfolio. And when you come to crunch time, historically, uh, where the market is down and dirty, uh, typically government issue bonds uh, are more stable. And you could certainly see that in 2008, our bond portfolio, which all governments, uh, that was up a around, I think, 8% uh, when uh, corporates were down about 10 and high yields were down about 20 yeah. So, so it's, and by the way, some high yields went down as far as 40%. Um, some went to zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, so, so the, the idea is to have something that's going to stabilize during the worst of times and to take your risk in the equity portion of the portfolio. That's where the payoff yeah. comes. Yeah. On the other hand, we, we do have a, what we call the Vanguard monthly income fund, which is a, a combination of, oh, but I didn't tell you what the actual asset allocation is with bonds, 50% uh, uh, immediate uh, term, uh, intermediate term, 20% uh, tips, and 30% uh, uh, short-term treasuries. Okay. So very conservative. Yeah, yeah. And not because I'm worried about a catastrophic event, but. Oh, we know you are, Paul. That cat's out of the back. We know. Um we didn't talk much about REITs, uh, and I know it's listed in your ultimate buy and hold, the 10 asset class. I think one of them is REITs, uh, but but it's not, you know, when you get down to just picking two or four funds, you don't include REITs. Uh, right. It, what we do is with the two or four funds, we want you to, we want to make sure you get the meat, the real stuff that's going to drive your long-term return. And that's the right balance of value. Uh, and 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 growth and small and large. If you that original table that you showed of the ultimate buy and hold, the addition of REITs, uh, it 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 did change a little bit. It was about one tenth of one percent or less by adding that, and it and it increased the amount of money that you would have made. But it was a minor difference. It actually is more impactful as a non-correlated asset. To the S and P 500 uh, than the actual return itself, but it's yeah. about the same return as the S and P 500. Yeah. That that's been my conclusion. It, it might give you some diversification. It's not going to give you a higher expected return. Right. Um, well, I, I, uh, I'm I, I'm 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 worn out, Paul. I don't know. These things exhaust <laughs> me. You've got far more well, energy you than know, I do. Rob, I would like I would I would like to just make a comment because, as you know, absolutely, my life is about educating more people uh, about, for example, the twelve million dollar decisions that we all have to make, and we're going to make them by design or by default, and they are covered in my free book. It's a free PDF that they can get it uh, on 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 our site. Uh, and and you can get an audio book free if you want uh, as as well. Uh, Don McDonald uh, was kind enough to read that for us, and and uh, that 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 book 
uh, shares a lot of what we believe in, but each of those 12 items are million dollar decisions for anybody in their 20s or 30s. It's and the We're Talking Millions book, right? We're Talking Millions, that's it. I mean, no, you I'm can gonna... buy it if you want, that's fine. But uh, the reason we want you to get it free is because if you like it, you can forward it to everybody you know, and we won't know who you forwarded it to, okay? So you don't have to worry about a salesman calling. I just put a link in the chat oh, great. Uh, to that book, and I will add it below the video as well. But I'm glad you mentioned that. So before we, we go, um, what's next for Paul Merriman? What are you working on? What's got you excited? Oh, man, I tell you, we got some great people uh, working with us. Uh, Craig Apple from Amazon, uh, that's his day job, but uh, he has he has provided us with a free lifetime investment calculator. And it is a wonderful calculator. I mean, you, for example, you could take all of our tables that go back the, the 52 years uh, and you can look at all the different combinations of bonds and equities and you can even take the returns that we show there and you can say, I don't like those returns. I want to cut everything by one and a half percent a year. You can you can start your you can start your performance in 1973 if you want. You can do it in 1990 and it'll 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 swing back around and, 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 and repeat through that 52 years. It, it shows you accumulation and distribution and all of those important decisions that you would like to make and hope the future looks like the past. Well, my recommendation is take the past and take 2% off a year and see how it holds up because so I think that is the conservative thing to do. Where do we get our hands on this calculator? It's right on our, right on our, on our homepage, the Merriman Lifetime Investment Calculator. And the amazing thing is Craig gave it to us. And the reason he gave it to us, talk about, about random events. He happened to see us noted. By the way, it, it could have been on your site for all I know, Rob. And he went to our site and we happened to be where he learned to invest. Huh. So he he developed this, this calculator so he could test his own concerns and then came to us and gave it to us. So, so that's a big deal. And, and, and we're always looking for new ways to teach and is we're trying the, to help. Um, is this, you, the portfolio, I know, you know, pardon. Is this the portfolio configurator? No, that's a brand new one that just came up today. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave that in the chat because it looks really cool. Yes, it is cool. Um, that's I don't Chris see often, often dig for the calculator. I don't actually see it, but it's probably me. You know, on the home page, there's supposed to be a a, a big section <laughs> devoted to it's, it. It's probably there, and I'm just yeah, blind. I'll back. send it to you. Here it I'll is. I just I just found it. Okay. All right, I can link to it. Good. There I, I are love people, calculators. Paul. Rob, there are people who 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 generously say to me, one, I talk too much, two, <laughs> I'm boring, and uh, and 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 three. My podcasts are way too long, and you just helped me do it again. Sorry, because Paul. I'm going to share this with our folks, and I, I I've enjoyed it. I threw, I threw you under the bus. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, are you going to be at the Bogleheads conference this year or no? No, no, I will be at a Boglehead conference when I am invited to speak. Okay, uh, it, it's really interesting. I taught at almost every AAII chapter in the country when I was working. I I flew and paid almost all the expenses myself to educate. And they finally, several years ago, invited me to come speak to the conference, national conference. And they've invited me back every year since. So I'm hoping one of these days the Bogleheads will invite me. I won't embarrass them or insult them um, be, because I'm not, I am a John Boglehead, if you want to think of it that way. I yeah. loved what that man did. But if I'm trying to help people and there's a fund that I think will help them earn more money or take less risk, I, I can't be dedicated 
just as I was never dedicated to DFA, we never told DFA we'll use just your funds. We yeah. always use what we thought were the best funds for our client. And I'm trying to do the same thing today. Yeah, sure. Well, good. Well, Paul, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you, Rob. Uh, You're doing great, great work. All right, gang. As I like to say at the end of every show, the remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. Um, I will put a lot of links under this video uh, over the next hour or so. And uh, great. Paul, thanks so much. Thank you, Rob. All the best to all of you folks. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.